Hello, 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 everyone. It's so good to be back with you. Um, last week, we were still on our way back from attending Leadership Institute from Church of the Resurrection at their Leewood, Kansas location in the Kansas City area. And boy, was it amazing. We had learned so much. Um, we're so inspired by so many great speakers. Um, and guess who I got to meet? I am so excited fangirl moment just kidding Bryant but it was great to meet you and I got him to sign one of his latest books do I stay Christian what an interesting question to have to ask in these days huh and so I'm excited to read this and uh, appreciate Brian taking the time to meet with me and to sign it um, we are going to continue our our journey through the book we make the road by walking by Brian McLaren and thank you again Brian for letting us do this work this year how you can visit his website and see more of the things that he um, has to offer in terms of writing and uh, books that will make you um, wrestle with things that you might uh, be struggling with already. And so um, you're gonna visit his website and that will be posted in the comment section um, with this uh, um, video. And also we'll have some questions. And uh, so to this week we're on chapter 38 the uprising of stewardship. And you're going to read, want to read the following passages. Deuteronomy 15 verses 1 through 11, 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 through 19, and 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 15. And you know what? We are just finishing up our series on stewardship. So let's see what um, Brian has to say about that through the mouths of the disciples. Let us imagine we are with Paul and his team of disciples in the city of Corinth in AD 51. We'll never forget Philippi and what we learned there about the uprising since leaving the Roman colony. We've visited several other cities, including Thessalonica and Berea. Now we have come to a city called Corinth. It's a city with a dirty reputation, well-deserved in many ways. The people here are tough mean, selfish. There are all kinds of religions, lots of temple prostitution, all the worst of big city life. But here, even here, an ecclesia of discipleship, fellowship, worship, and partnership is forming. It looks like Paul, Silas, and Timothy plan to settle here for a year or so. They have joined with a local couple, Priscilla and Aquila, to start a small business making tents. Together, we can produce and sell tents to make enough money that we won't be a burden on the Ecclesia here. Speaking of money, you don't have to live very long to know that money rules this world. People with money and have power, and to them, what matters most is getting more of both. We see that here in Corinth, and it's obvious around the whole empire, Paul is very suspicious of money. To him, loving money is at the root of all kinds of evil. What really counts isn't gold, but the contentment that comes with desiring God above all else. Again and again, he teaches us that the drive to accumulate money wastes our lives. Our real ambition should be to build a big account of good works, acts of generosity and kindness on behalf of those considered the last, the least, and the lost. Paul loves to quote Jesus' words that it is better to give than to receive. That's why he got us making tents. He wants us to have enough money to provide for our needs, plus more to share with others. When the first uprising began in Jerusalem, people started bringing all their possessions to the apostles. Since they knew it wasn't God's will for some of us to have luxuries while others lack necessities, those with surplus began to share freely with those in need. We held all things in common. As you might expect, that created some problems. Some old prejudices sprang up between Jews and Greeks, and some people began playing games, pretending to be more generous than they really were. In spite of the problems, holding all things common was a beautiful thing. Some of us still practice the all things in common rule, as they did at the beginning, and some have modified that rule. But what hasn't changed and what must never change is this. We realize that the systems of this world run on one economy, and we in the commonwealth of God run on another. In our alternate economy, those who have 
a lot don't hoard it. They share it. Those who have been given much in terms of money and power feel not a sense of privilege and superiority, but a sense of greater responsibility for their neighbors who are vulnerable and in need. We measure our well-being and holiness by the condition of the weakest and the neediest among us. According across the Roman Empire, and especially here in Corinth, people exhaust themselves to get rich, and in doing so, they cause such harm. Some exploit the land. You might say they are thieves who take more from the bank of creation than they put back. And in this that way, they steal from unborn generations. Others exploit people of this generation. They are thieves who make big profits through the sweat of their poorly paid neighbors, reducing them, if not to slavery, then to something almost the same. They are often very subtle in the ways they do this, using banks, investments, and loans to enrich themselves as they impoverish others. It's a dirty economy, and those who profit by it gain the world and lose their souls. What's yours is mine, some people say, and I want to steal it. What's mine is mine, some people say, and I want to keep it. What's mine is God's, we are learning to say. And I want to use it for the common good. We call that attitude stewardship. Stewardship applies to all areas of our lives. How we use time, potential, possessions, privilege, and power. Whatever we do, we try to give it our very best because we work for Christ and not just for money. We want no part of dishonest or harmful employment. So if necessary, we change jobs or we work for reform so we can stay in current jobs with a clear conscience. As we are being transformed personally, we seek to transform our economic systems from corrupt to ethical, from destructive to regenerative, from cruel and dehumanizing to kind and humane. We believe this pleases God. When it comes to how we spend our earnings, stewardship means living below our means. We do so by dividing our income into three parts. First, we determine a percentage that we will use to provide for our needs and the needs of our families. That's just basic decency. Second, we determine a percentage to save since wisdom requires foresight. Even ants know to save some of their summer work to get them through the winter. Third, we set aside the largest portion we can for God's work of compassion, justice, restoration, and peace. Some of this per third portion goes to people like Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who lead and serve the ecclesia springing up around the world. Some of it goes to members of the ecclesia who are in need, the sick and the widows, the orphans, the elderly, and those who have lost their homes, their land, and their work. Some of it goes to meet the needs of others near or far as an expression of God's love and ours. That's what stewardship is, really, love in action. Paul reminds us that nothing has any value without love. That explains why money is so deceptive. It deceives people about what has true value. You cannot serve two masters, Jesus taught. If you love God, you will hate money because it always gets in the way of loving God. If you love money, you will hate God because God always gets in the way of loving money. It is foolish to live about above your means. It is selfish to spend all your money on yourself. It is godliness to give, to produce a surplus that is used for the commonwealth of God, which is an uprising of greed, not of greed, but of joyful generosity and a creative stewardship. Let us lift a glass and say, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. We too are rising up. We are rising up indeed. Let us arise in fellowship, in fellowship indeed. Let us arise in discipleship, in discipleship indeed. Let us arise in worship, in worship indeed. Let us arise in partnership, in partnership indeed. Let us arise in stewardship, in stewardship indeed. All right, that's our reading for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I know we're a little behind. We'll work on getting caught up. Um, and I'll let you know when we're going to start doing that catch up. It'll be probably on Wednesdays like we've been doing in the past. So 
All right, let's have a word of prayer, shall we, and send you off to your week. Lord Jesus, um, thank you for this uh, message that you have expressed and have and that has been passed on through your disciples and apostles like Paul, um, that um, to love you is to uh, give up the love of money. And sometimes that can be hard when we have a lot, even as the rich young ruler showed us. But Lord Jesus, we know that um, whatever we give to you will never return void to us. And so Lord Jesus, let us find the ways in which our heart can find passion for what we give our money to as we seek to serve you with all our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, have a great week. It's great to be back with you all, um, and we will uh, see you again next week. Bye.